So, uh, I, I can't see it because I am not going to post the video, but she started having signs that she was going to be falling soon. She was standing up and down a bit, um, turning and looking at her sides. Um, that went on for a while. I went out to the barn and uh, watched her for a while. She started having contractions. Um, I didn't see any progress happening, so I changed my position, went to a, an actual stall to look at her, and um, that's when I saw the dark grayish red bulge instead of what would normally be either a bull's hooves or a white kind of sack bulging out that hasn't had um, the fluid burst or anything like that, the Allen toe of sack. So, to quickly cover what happened, she um, was, sorry, I'm trying to get my thoughts in order here. She was, or he, he was born, um, so the position was, oh god, what do you even call it now? I guess the upside down, ups, is it upside down, head up, um, and red bag. So what that is essentially, red bag is the center previa, sent it attaches from inside the uterus and goes to the, uh, the cervix and exits um, and it's what you see first. The problem there is that when the placenta is detached from the uterus, there is no longer that uh, blood barrier between the foal and the dam, and so it's not receiving any oxygen. Um, it's a, an emergency situation where you basically just grab the foal and you start pulling to get it out. If you don't, the foal suffocates I, would be the best way to describe it. Um, it never gets to breathe at all. It just runs out of oxygen um, in its blood. It's something that happens within minutes. So that was the first... Sorry, Brenda, just... So that was the first major hurdle in the situation. And I saw that and went, okay, we've dealt with the red bag before. We have a video of it before that you can watch. Um, no problem. I just hopped in. I called out Brenda's name. She was in the house. And I got ready to start pulling the bag out, pulling the, the placenta out to get to the full, to be able to pull the full out. Um, at that point, once I was finally able to get it torn open to be able to get my hands in there to grab the full, there were no legs. And so um, the, I believe you call it upside down, I've got it in my book inside, upside down. So what happens is the full was lying on its back, looking up at the mare's spine. Normally what happens, that's their position when they're in the belly, just about ready to be born. They'll be lying there looking up the spine and then when they get uh, in the birth canal, just before they hit the birth canal, they have their legs offset like this and above their head like that. And as soon as it starts to go in the birth canal or the vagina, it takes this kind of corkscrew turn so that just as it's coming out, it does that turn and it actually ends up coming out like this. If I were her, then you, they end up coming out like that instead of like that. And so he never turned. And when you come out, you can see even on the back end of the horse is rounded like this and you want to come out and that direction. And when you're upside down, you're like that, and that bends the opposite direction you should be going, and it becomes very difficult to get the full out. Basically, the only way you can do it is stuff it back in and walk the mare or turn the full around 
and then um, try again. So that was the next problem. On top of that, when I put my hand in, I felt the skull, and I didn't feel legs, and I didn't feel the nose. So at this point, the arms were tucked in. So instead of being out like that, it was like this. And then instead of having the nose pointed, the head was tucked down into the chest. So I was feeling the back of the skull where I should be feeling two toes or two feet and then the nose. At that point, um, the foal was, was doomed. It, there was no way on earth I could correct that in time to, uh, before the foal died. So at that point, the, the race was to save Alea. Um, the, the biggest problem was knowing exactly what position the foal was in was extremely difficult at the time because her cervix hadn't completely dilated. So there wasn't room to feel <laughs> what was going on and the position of the foal because you, the foal was taking up essentially the, all of the room and you could barely get slide your fingers and so you couldn't feel or grab anything, um, which made things even worse, obviously. I was able to get both legs after a lot of work, both legs forward first, but was never able to get the head to flip up. And we tried a few times to try to pull the foal out um, and was unable to get the foal over the uh, over the sacrum to go up the pelvis to come up and over that the hill on their back and down towards the tail. We could never get up and through. There's an opening there, and it would not fit, could not fit, and it didn't matter what we did. Um, as soon as it was a red bag, and as soon as I didn't feel the feet, I called the vet and just said, you need to get out here. This is, you know, the situation's really bad. So the vet's on the way. We're trying repeatedly. Finally, after about 35 minutes, we just stopped. Um, we were exhausted. We weren't getting anywhere. We were unable to reposition the foal. Um, horses have very, very strong contractions, and our arms, when our arm was in there, you could only fit one, was being completely like crushed. And there, every time you try to slide in near the head to reposition anything, she would have a contraction. And we got to the point where we weren't going, getting anywhere. So at that point, we waited for the vet. Um, vet shows up, tries a couple times, and then goes, all right, you need a sedator. We sedate her so that he could really get in there and work around. Um, even then, he's like, I can't do much. She's not fully dilated. Um, he's moving around, and he's finally able to go, okay, here's the arm, there's the arm. And, and it took him a minute to try to sort out everything. He pushed stuff in and pulled it out a couple times. Finally, okay, we've got the arms, the back of the skull. Tried repeatedly to flip the skull up so that we could actually pull it out. Couldn't do it, couldn't do it. Um, gave her some, uh, an epidural. Hey, you good? Give her an epidural to try to see if we can get her to relax because she was still um, having contractions. Even then, couldn't do it. So we ended up um, opting instead of putting her down to go and take the next step, which was getting ketamine, completely dropping her down on the ground. Um, it's dangerous. As soon as you put a horse on the ground with uh, anesthesia, there's a danger of, of them dying because sometimes they don't come out of it well. Um, the longer a horse is down on the ground, the greater the chance that they will uh, die. Um, and the bigger concern was the way we had to do this was we had to install a bolt up there, run a rope down, tie it on her legs, and then hoist her legs up 
so that her back was, you know, that high off the ground near her, uh, her hind end. The reason we had to do that was so that all of the intestines would slide forward towards the diaphragm and the lungs so there was room to move the fold. That becomes risky because then that starts to put pressure on the lungs. Puts pressure on the lungs, which then increases the chance of the mare dying. So we got to that point, had her totally anesthetized, had her hind up in the air, um, pulling on the foal, repositioning the foal, pulling on the foal over and over and just weren't getting anywhere. And I don't even know how long we, for an hour we were working to get that foal out. Um, we were finally able to, after multiple attempts, he was finally able to get just, I don't even know what part, some part of the jaw that he was able to finally get a hold of to flip the nose up. At that point, we were able, then able to work and work to where we were able to see the, the, the tongue and part of the lower, no, the upper jaw actually sticking out. Um, this is where it gets kind of graphic, but I'm just telling you everything that occurred. Um, we started traction, so there are two different types. There are chains and there are like nylon webbing, and then you have handles and you wrap them around the legs. They do this with cows a lot. Um, and you start pulling. <laughs> it's a uh, very, uh, very simple thing. You try not to do it with horses. Um, horses have a much higher incidence of uh, tearing, vaginal tearing, um, a hoof going up and per perforating the vaginal wall and going up into the the rectum, which would then kill the mare. Um, perforation down into the uh, abdominal cavity, which will then result in peritonitis and kill the mare. Um, tearing of the uh, uterus, which can then cause the mare to bleed and bleed internally and die. So there are a lot of complications. Um, we decided if we don't get the full out, she's going to die. She may die with us getting the foal out, so we're going to try, essentially. Let's just give it a shot because she's six of one, half a dozen of the other. She's going to die, so let's at least see if we can possibly save her. Uh, at that point, we would pull. I ended up on traction, and then he would reposition the foal slightly, and then we'd pull, and then I'd hold steady pressure and then he repositioned. We kept doing this repeatedly until finally we felt like we had it in a position that would work and we started pulling and then we felt a give and we were going, all right, either A, that's a part of the fold that has given or it's actually shifted and in, moved in position and it'll be easier to get it out. So here's where it gets graphic. What ended up happening next is we had to put our feet on her hind end because we didn't have the just an actual tool used for cattle for pulling calves out. It's a really cool tool. We didn't have one. So we each put a foot on her hind, holding a handle each on the chain and webbing for the traction, and just started pulling. Um, and both of the arms came off. So we ended up, and just so you know, the foal is dead, long dead, been a long time dead. So the arms came right off at the shoulder, just slipped right out. Um, there is no socket that they're in. Um, and so it, it, not like anything, nothing really had to break. It's just all ligament, tendon, muscle, um, at that point, we went, oh great, now we're in a lot of trouble. We don't have anything to hold on to to get the full out. Um, the head was there, so he was able to get his hand in and kind of grab the, the jaw again and pull. And then he was finally able to get behind the head itself and start pulling. Once we got the head out, then we were able to wrap and come 
combined get the rest of the full out. We had to twist it a couple of times because the neck showtime. The neck was uh, kind of curved, so not only did it tip its head down like that, it like did this weird curve with its head. So we had to reposition it several times, slowly twisting it, because the cervix was so tight. We are finally able to get the full out, at which point we went into recovery with Alea, um, waiting for her to come back, come out, help her stand up, um, keep her from stumbling around, hitting things, thrashing, falling. This happens to horses when they're coming out of sedation. Thankfully, she didn't. Then waited her for her to fully recover, put her on two painkillers, um, antibiotics. We flushed out her uterus, basically just putting a tube up and putting uh, like a, an iodine solution and flushing out everything in her uterus. Did that a couple times, and then it turned into a game of waiting. Um, the most severe problems, like internal bleeding, she would have died fairly soon after she was up. So, rather quickly we went, great, there's no internal bleeding. The next problem is um, essentially if she develops, um, if there happened to be like a minor tear, then getting peritonitis. Um, and so at that point it's like, okay, we keep an eye on her, we watch her, we see if she starts to uh, shake, shiver, sweat, um, temperature skyrockets, things like that, then you know that there's some sort of infection. And she has not developed, displayed those signs yet, thankfully. And so the last bat, the last thing is just other types of uh, bacterial infections, and she's on antibiotics for that as well. She's also on oxytocin for another 24 hours, I believe, which oxytocin con con causes contractions and that's to make sure that everything inside her uterus is pushed out. Because if anything's left in there, it will start to rot inside and then she'll get an infection and die. So that's where we are right now. And it's just waiting the next several days. Um, gets a painkiller twice a day, antibiotics twice a day, um, constant supervision, and if she gets by for three days, she's pretty, pretty good, pretty safe, um, I guess, would be the way to uh, talk about it. If she goes three days, I feel confident that she will uh, survive, and at which point um, later on in the spring, I'll talk to the vet for sure, but then having her ultrasounded to see what kind, if any, damage was done to, uh, to her uterus, scarring, um, things like that, to see um, essentially, is she still okay to breed? Um, whether or not we decide to breed her, even if she is okay to breed, is a separate subject. But to see what condition she's in, and also the possibility of harvesting eggs, so that's where we sit with that. Uh, yeah, so I will, I guess, answer a couple questions. Uh, oh, yeah, there, so I guess people, there was absolutely nothing abnormal about what happened. There is literally nothing that anyone could have done unless we had a window on the side of her body to see exactly where the foal was and how it was moving and to know how dilated the cervix was. I mean, there, it was the perfect storm. Um, each of those problems are things that by themselves can be dealt with and, and addressed and safely deliver a foal um, individually, but with the head being tucked, and upside down, and red bag, and having the arms 
tucked into the chest as well. All of those combined, it's there's no way on earth the foe would ever survive, and it's not quite a miracle that she's still alive, but uh, she had very, very, very small odds to live. And so she's still alive, which is kind of crazy. Um, like that night joke that uh, she is part cow, because you can do just about anything to a cow, and they're perfectly fine, and uh, have a wonderful day. He says even sometimes they leave like pieces of uterus or uh, placenta inside the uterus and just let it rot and come out, and the cows don't even care. Where with a horse, it would die rather quickly. So there's some sort of super machine. Um, questions? How are Brenda and I coping with this? Um, I am, mm, I'm, Brenda and I are two totally different people. Uh, I am very pragmatic. I have very little emotion. And uh, so to me, the dealing with it is partially just intrigue and interest because that's something that really, even as a, a vet, you would see once in your life it, the entire situation, the whole combination. Um, so it was very interesting to to be there as it unfolded and all the way through to the end, and it was wonderful that uh, Alea stayed alive um, so far. I still don't know whether or not she'll succumb to something else um, after this process. So there was that, the, just the absolute interest factor um, that and I have a really good relationship, so we actually talk through these things about stuff other than what we're working on and also what we're specifically working on. So it's a really nice uh, synergistic relationship, and I learn a lot from him, and so I enjoy doing... I don't enjoy the fact that they happen, but when odd things like this do occur, I enjoy being there because I learn um, it's easy for me to distance myself emotionally from a situation. While I was waiting for him to show up um, and Brenda had gone into the house, I tried by myself a few more times to adjust and move the foal and just went, this isn't going to happen, and gave myself about one minute to really just kind of freak out in my head, and then went, okay, I'm done. Now I dealt with that. And now I just wait for the vet, and I don't need to do... Now I can just focus on the job at hand and get it taken care of. Um, Brenda... It's not... So the tragedy is we didn't ever know the foal in any way. Um, obviously, no one knew the foal. It uh, died before it ever had a chance to be born. So it it's not like... Uh, you know, it's not like when Puck died, or Annie, where there was a, a, an emotional relationship established. It was more of a loss of just life, and then a lie, loss of something that you have been breeding for for a while, um, specifically Olay and Rez, that uh, combination. And so I think Brenda, and you could ask her, is very hurts not that she's affected by it a lot more than me but um, the silver lining and it is a huge silver lining is that Olay is still alive um, so that that was actually a decision when we started breeding was sometimes you get in a situation where it may come down to do you save the foal or do you save the mare and we sat down and talked and decided that in those situations, we would save the mare. Uh, so I think it was easier for us. Uh, we were already prepared. Uh, obviously not prepared, prepared, but had at least mentally thought of a situation possibly occurring where you may have to make a decision one or the other. So 
although in this case we didn't make a decision for the other, we were still prepared for the idea that the foal would die and the mare would live. So I think we were, we've been fortunate in such a horrible situation. I'm not sure how to, I don't know how to describe it at all. Um, 